Can we just do a test for the captions, please, Roxanne? That's great, thank you. Hi everybody, welcome to this evening's workshop about human rights as a deaf person. Just stop That's for a minute, we don't, we don't have the deaf person spotlighted. We're kicking off in roughly five minutes. If you have any questions, uh, you can ask those through Zoom. Or if you'd like to watch us via Facebook Live, you also have that option. I look forward to seeing you all and uh, beginning this workshop very soon. Good evening everybody, welcome to our workshop about your rights as a deaf person and self-advocacy. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Philip, I'll be running uh, this evening's walk workshop. Please get yourselves uh, comfortable, we'll be starting in roughly four minutes and you can either join us through Zoom where you have the opportunity to ask questions in Auslan or watch us through Facebook on our live stream at Deaf Victoria's Facebook page. Look forward to um, beginning this workshop very soon.
our community workshop. And our first workshop on this series. The focus of tonight will be your rights as a deaf person and self-advocacy. My name is Sherry Beaver. I work as a project coordinator at Deaf Victoria. And this is one of the projects I've been responsible for uh, delivering. There's a team of us working here. Uh, we're currently in JML in East Melbourne at Expression Australia's head office. We're making sure we're following uh, the COVID workplace rules and uh, adhering to social distancing requirements and also um, our face masks as well. We have Maxine Buxton here, who's a general manager of Deaf Victoria. She's looking after the technical side, especially our live streaming. We also have our individual advocacy officer, Catherine Dunn, here this, this evening. She'll be also um, managing the QA aspect, uh, so you'll see her on screen later tonight. We have a new staff member, which we're very excited to introduce to you all. Our information communications officer is Sarah Weir, who is sitting not too far from me, obviously at the right distance, but um, we'll see her on the screen shortly. Hello everybody, my name is Sarah Weir. I've recently joined Deaf Victoria as an information officer. I'm very excited to work with the Deaf Victoria team and also with you all, the Deaf community. So, thank you. A very exciting announcement and a wonderful development in seeing our team continue to grow here at Deaf Victoria. Before we begin, I would like to do an acknowledgement of country and pay our respects to the land upon where we all meet. We're here on the Wurundjeri Kulin Nation who, and we pay our respects to the elders who have looked after and cultivated the land upon which we meet. And I would like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I would now like to also take the opportunity to acknowledge our deaf leaders who have worked tirelessly for the deaf community to create a healthy culture and healthy language that we all use and celebrate Auslan. I'd like to pay respects to our deaf leaders from the past, the present and the future who have worked considerably hard to create the community that we see ourselves enjoying now and without the work that they have put in over the many years we wouldn't have as much access as we have now so I would like to take the time to pay my respects to those deaf leaders and pioneers. So this community workshop is supported by the NDIS, the National Disability Insurance Scheme, in the Information Linkages and Capacity Building or ILC grant that we were successful in receiving. So we're very appreciative in them providing us those funds to deliver this project. It's quite a large project that is a capacity building project run by Deaf Victoria that has two different focuses. The first being the organisation and capacity building of our, our board, our staff through professional development and skill development opportunities, which we'll see that our organisation strengthen. The second aspect is the support to the deaf and hard of hearing community. So the provision of workshops and provision of information to really empower deaf and hard of hearing people to become more competent individuals and more knowledgeable individuals to advocate and be able to access society as a whole. We're here at the JML Centre as I said. I would like to say thank you to Expression Australia for allowing us to use the space here in their office. It's a strange time actually coming together with others uh, during COVID. Uh, we're very appreciative that we've been able to use this space so we can run tonight as successfully as possible um, from where we find ourselves. So I would now uh, like to pass uh, the screen over to Kate, who will just quickly introduce herself. Hi all, my name is Catherine. I work at Deaf Victoria as an individual, advocate, individual advocacy officer really excited that you are all joining us. If 
you have any questions throughout the presentation, there are two different ways uh, that you can ask those questions through Facebook. If you're watching, you can add comments on Facebook and we'll respond when we reach that time in the evening. If you're watching on Facebook, but you would like um, to, you have options, you can either send it um, privately on comments or on our phone number 0431 476 721. If you're watching on Zoom, sometimes it's difficult seeing um, the PowerPoint and the person signing. So just if you are seeing a smaller tile of the signer, you can toggle the screen in the middle and make the signer larger. So you can use the QA uh, function as well to ask questions if you're connecting in through Zoom. So you'll see the symbols down the bottom. Please don't use the chat function. Please use the Q&A function to ask those questions and we'll be able to respond to those as well uh, when we reach that point in the evening. And if you've got any difficulties uh, connecting in or any technical difficulties, please do let us know. And if you have any specific individual advocacy issues, uh, we'll be in contact as well. Uh, to provide support. So thank you, enjoy tonight, and I'll pass back over to Shuri. Thank you so much, Kate. So in housekeeping on Zoom, um, please uh, don't use the chat function if you're connecting in through Zoom. The reason being, the comments typed into chat will also be displayed uh, on the live stream video. So we would like if you could um, use the QA function, but if you do have a question and you'd like to ask that in Auslan, please uh, type into the chat section, uh, I would like to ask a question, um, or rather, sorry, in the Q&A section, so we'll know uh, that you would like to ask a question, and you can do that in Auslan. I'm delighted now to introduce Philip Waters, from the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission who will be presenting tonight's community workshop. And uh, we'll welcome him onto our screens now and hopefully uh, you all enjoy tonight's community workshop. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here to present on this topic with you all. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where you are all meeting, whether it's in Victoria or around the country, and also pay my respects to deaf elders, past, present and emerging. Um, there are so many deaf people that I've met over the years uh, that I cherish and hold those memories tight. So human rights is a, a complex subject matter. So my apologies in advance that some of my slides uh, are quite text heavy. So I won't um, refer too much to the slides, but I will be uh, obviously presenting that information as visually as possible in Auslan. So talking about human rights and deaf rights and where those two intersect and the differences. So first I'll be talking about human rights and deaf rights, but what human rights actually are and if you do face discrimination or any difficulties, how you can get support is an aim of tonight's community workshop as well. So to help uh, get a better understanding of what your rights are and what to do if you feel like your rights are not being respected. So presenting online um, is, is quite difficult. It presents its own difficulties. I always enjoy presenting and being able to engage directly with the audience members. So obviously because I can't see you all, um, at times um, that, that poses its challenges in terms of how I present information. So I would like to uh, remind you in terms of the law and uh, human rights law, I'd just like to remind you that that information is related to Victoria. I welcome all deaf community members that are joining us from around the country. But just to make clear, the laws that I'll be talking specifically are for the Victorian context here. Other states have their own unique laws. So hopefully this information will still be of interest to you, um, but just take note that the context is definitely Victorian. To 
you mind just going back to the previous slide? So the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission, or VERIOC, has a responsibility and focus on human rights within government. There are three different laws that we are accountable or responsible for, which I'll share shortly. But in terms of human rights and why they are important, really each individual has their own unique characteristics and human rights is something that all people have a right to, and really human rights are about creating an accessible, cohesive community. The World Federation of the Deaf, World WFD, also talks about human rights for deaf people, and human rights being important for deaf people in the success of their lives, and reducing the barriers that deaf people face. And Veriok very much has a focus on reducing those barriers and creating a just and equal society here in Victoria. Slide, please. Next slide, thank you. So the human rights and the, the law that we see human rights um, be associated to, we think back to World War II and the atrocities that we saw during World War II. At that time, there was a, a global recognition in terms of people's rights, and at that point, the United Nations was established, or the UN as it's commonly known, and really they were tasked with thinking about society and the world's rights, human rights. In 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was made, and then from there we saw more specific specialties uh, or specific aspects of human life. So we see the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, and then below that you can see race, women, torture, so not being able to torture people the rights of children, the rights of Indigenous people, and then we see lastly in 2008 the rights of people who have a disability, which is a CRPD. So really we see that happening in 2008. A large proportion of the world's population have a disability, but that disability not only impacts the individual, but the people that are in their immediate uh, family and network. So disability does have intersect with a large proportion of the community. Uh, next slide, thank you. So thinking about Australia now and the movement towards disability inclusion. In 1981, the International Year of Disabled Persons really was a significant year globally in the recognition and understanding of the rights of people with a disability. We saw marches and uh, protests happening around uh, the world. And at that point, there was a recognition of people with a disability deserve their own set of rights. Previous to that, prior to 1981, really there was not much understanding. In 1982, we saw the Victorians with disabilities uh, being protected under the Equal Opportunity Act. And we see disability being recognised. Um, in 92, we have the Federal Disability Discrimination Act, which is uh, monitored at a federal level. And you can see then moving down to 2006, the Victorian Disability Act was established. And I should also mention the Charter of Human Rights, which I'll be talking in more detail about shortly, but the Equal Opportunity Act and the Charter of Human Rights are two very critical pieces. And you can see in 2010, the National Disability Strategy was launched, which meant um, there was funding committed to for people with a disability in ensuring the Australian society is more equal and fair for people with a disability 
in Victoria, there are two disability plans that have funding associated to those for people with a disability, um, the funding towards programs and initiatives to make Victoria more inclusive for people with a disability. So now about um, Veriog, the, the Commission. People can make contact directly with the Commission if they feel as though their rights have been breached or they have any questions or queries about their rights. If you think most recently about um, the COVID restrictions, there were a lot of people making contact to the Commission about the breach of their rights um, to do with masks or curfews or a variety of different uh, reasons. If people want assistance or um, help. 43% of our complaints at the Commission are related directly to disability complaints. The Commission is very aware that the high proportion of our complaints are from people with a disability and we see that as a significant issue in the Victorian community. Right, next slide please. The Commission works very closely with government and organisations. And the Commission provides education to government and organisations. At times people are wanting to know more about the laws here in Victoria and human rights laws here in, here in Victoria. The Commission has a team of educators which of course used to be face to face but now that's delivered online. They're usually two hour workshops or one day workshops to, um, helping people learn more about the Charter of Human Rights, the Equal Opportunity Act. And we also deal with complaints as well where people um, who would like to make a complaint about their human rights being breached is raised with uh, Veriog. And we also um, can arrange mediation sessions where the, per the complainant and the person that making the complaint against can come together and there's no need to go to court. We offer that opportunity to mediate and hopefully resolve the issue. If resolution can't be found, uh, then VCAT and other court systems are utilised. As well, if new laws are being passed or in Parliament or judges are making certain decisions, um, the Commission uh, will be involved in providing advice about human rights law what considerations need to be made. For example, um, certain judicial requirements and the rights that people hold in court and making sure those are adhered to. As well, uh, in Parliament, if you think here in Victoria, most recently with the curfews and the new um, laws that came in place to do with the COVID restrictions and the limitations for people's human rights, where can people, the right for people go where they want. But obviously those being uh, restricted and masks being a requirement of the population, there was discussion with the Commission and the Parliament to make sure people's rights were adhered to and time limits um, are adhered to as well with certain laws being in place for a, a certain period of time, six months as an example. So these restrictions are a long period of time. One example, in 2016, when I worked with Deaf Victoria, we had a consultation and we developed a series of resources for interpreters, uh, hospital staff, and patients with regard to accessing the health system, particularly in hospitals. Deaf people frequently face barriers when they present at hospitals to see health professionals. Often people deny them equal access by not engaging an interpreter. So we created a Science for Health resource to educate hospital staff about deaf people's access, what that meant, what did that entail. We also then uh, informed the deaf community if they were denied their rights, what avenues were available to them, as you can see on this website here. The Commission 
um, will include some disinformation in its new website. We want to ensure that the Commission's website is accessible as well. I want to share my own personal story with you that I had my human rights denied to me. My wife is not deaf, she can hear. She was pregnant, and that time we were going to a hospital. We planned to go to this particular hospital. The hospital denied us an interpreter because my wife could hear. She was the patient. I was considered not to be the patient. I said, where's my right to access with my wife? The hospital said, the hospital representative said, your wife can interpret for you during these sessions. This really made me angry and uneasy. And I took that through. And in the end, suffice to say, we were able to get an interpreter. But this is just a simple example of where your human rights can be denied in a variety of situations and settings, including when you're in hospital. So what we're wanting to ensure is that you uh, have every right to ensure that your human rights are acknowledged and abided by. It can be hard to make a you know, complaint to make some uh, focus or attention to ensure that you receive those. But the two human rights laws I want to focus on in particular, which hopefully will make your job if you're in that situation a little easier. Okay, now this slide here. Yeah, the Commission has responsibilities under three Victorian laws. Um, other laws we don't have um, the same type of amendment. One, the Equal Opportunities Act. Two, the Charter of Human Rights. And thirdly, the Racial and Religious Tolerance Act. These three pieces of legislation. I won't go into depth into with regard to the third piece, but the two the first piece of legislation I want. Um, this third piece of legislation is a, a weak piece of legislation. If someone wanted to argue that they were being discriminated against based upon the attribute of race or religion, it's very hard to prove that I'm court of law because the legislation is quite weak. It's just in 2001 since the law was established and approved by the, the, the Parliament. And one person has been successful in using that legislation to gain their human rights. So the Commission realises that it's too hard, too high a hurdle for people to climb over it. So they're in the process of now um, reviewing that. And if you want to share your opinion about how that can be improved, the Victorian Parliament's website is taking on community consultation and feedback. So I want to focus now upon the two early pieces of, pieces of legislation and the similarities and the differences. Both laws, uh, as I said, Victoria, the state-based laws, to Victoria. At the same time, the disability discrimination at the Commonwealth level uh, provides guidance to the Victorian legislation at the state level. Okay. Now, the Equal Opportunity Act 2010. When we talk about discrimination and what discrimination can be defined by, there's certain types of discrimination which are allowed to be admitted. For example, women's only swimming um, club or women's only swimming time. That is a form of discrimination, but it's not unlawful. There are two different types of discrimination, direct discrimination or indirect discrimination. I'll go into those two shortly. The Equal Opportunity Act also uh, talks about a positive duty. Now that's a key concept. Um, it's lawyer talk, you know, lawyers love to talk. Uh, so in brief, what that means is that people can't say, oh, you have a human right, I didn't realise that. What is it? So the onus is on, on the obligation, the onus is on organisations to think, if I did this particular act, would it infringe upon the human rights of other people in the state? And if so, it's a positive duty on that organisation to ensure that they do not breach individual human rights. If an organisation says, I was unaware, I didn't know, you know that ignorance is no excuse for the law. This law pertains to all, and the onus, in this case, a positive duty is on organisations. Something with sexual harassments, I know a lot of deaf women and girls have experienced sexual harassment. And there's protections in place there to ensure that that is prohibited. Uh, we also talk about people who are targeting others' victimization being uh, targeted by certain people, so we want to avoid victimizing individuals. Another key concept within this piece of legislation is reasonable accommodations. Uh, I don't fully understand it by 
myself. I'm not a lawyer in terms of what's the difference between reasonable accommodations and reasonable adjustments. But in layperson speak, if, for example, I wanted to watch a ca captioned movie on television, I think the television broadcasters may say, oh, it's too hard, it's too expensive for us to do that. The Equal Opportunity Act has a number of provisions um, which uh, they, if a person took this to court, the court would have to consider if it is reasonable or unreasonable to make those accommodations or adjustments. And when it comes to Victoria, direct discrimination, regardless of if you are from Western Australia and you were in Victoria for a meeting, if you were denied an interpreter, you experienced some type of discrimination, some barrier, loss of your human rights, because you are in Victoria and on these lands, and this legislation relates to all people who are in Victoria, you have to be Victorian, this then protects you. So if you're visiting from interstate, and you're visiting, for example, um, an organisation and you wanted to access particular uh, information or services and they deny that to you, you can make a claim of this particular piece of legislation. So I'm going to go to direct discrimination now. Again, in brief, that means if you are prevented from accessing a particular uh, information or service, you as an individual, you've been prevented based upon your race, your disability, your death, your gender, your identity, or any other type of characteristic listed there. present a few different scenarios to you. Some relate to deaf people and some do not. They're of general, general nature or application. So let's say for arguments like you're at a community centre 
and you may have a assistance dog or a pet animal. Is that discrimination? When you're a parent and you're taking your child to childcare, but the service provider says no because your child has a learning disability. Or how about you want to talk to someone um, and you're the only deaf person in the room and everyone else doesn't communicate in sign language and they really don't pay any attention to you. They don't want to let you speak or have a right to speak. Or perhaps, you know, you're at school, okay, and school teachers are in the lunchroom having a lunch and they see the short session person walking past and make jokes. Or perhaps they see a person with cerebral palsy and they think, is that person drunk? Uh, we won't let them enter these premises. It might be a bar, it could be something else. They are denied entry because they appear to be doing it. You know, in real life, most cases are not clear cut. Sometimes they are clear cut, and you know, it's discrimination, 100%. But other times, it's indirect discrimination. So, remember, direct discrimination is discrimination against me based upon a particular attribute. Uh, being singled out or being labelled like um, you're a deaf person, all you deaf people are the same. Okay. Like direct discrimination. If you did allege discrimination and you went through the legal process, um, number one, you have to prove that they targeted you or they targeted someone that you were with and you were discriminated against. I'll give you a few examples. Let's say you're looking for a job. The job description says you must be able to use the telephone. You think, well, how am I going to do that? I'm deaf. The employer says, don't bother. Hey, hold on. You have a obligation to ensure some type of reasonable accommodation. Okay. So we could find ways to do the job by using other forms of technology. Now, that's not to say that blind people can apply for jobs as truck drivers or bus drivers. Okay. I'm not saying that. Okay, that's not that's unreasonable. But I'm thinking about the TTY. Forgive me, everyone. Back in the olden days, when we were, you know, we had to use some other form of technology. We'd have to use a, a telephone typewriter or VRS or SMS or other, some other type of uh, technology to ensure that we can still use the telecommunication system. So now, for example, an employer would have to say, "Look, we thought about the VRS. We could do it, but you know, there's, there's long wait times. Um, you'd have to be waiting." Like, who knows how long before you have to talk to the counselor? So, then uh, overall, we don't think you can do the job based on these reasons. Okay. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so employers, service providers, people in the community, community organizations, they have to, they have to make those reasonable adjustments. They can't just say, don't bother, don't come here, and deny you access. There has to be attempts made and reasonable adjustments. Service providers and employees must do that. There's an onus on them. They have an obligation. They cannot turn you away because that's too hard. They're legally bound to provide access to you. You have a human right. You're applying to do a job. You know you have the skills to do the job. But if you're applying for a job and you don't have the skills, you don't know, don't know how to do the job. That's a different matter. Okay, don't confuse that with discrimination. Discrimination is when the employer says you can't do the job because of I choose this example because many deaf people frequently have this very experience. Okay. I don't know why, but they're talking about particular access barriers. Um, a job's advertised, an employer says, um, I'm looking for a particular person to do a job, I'll give it to you, I'll give it to you. And a lot of deaf people say, Look, I don't hear about these jobs. It happened to me often. I was at Somehow I find out, oh, you've got a new job. Congratulations to my peer. I, I asked my boss, how was it? I said, that, you know, this colleague got the job. They said, oh, they heard about it, or I told them about it. I said, that's great, but you know, I would have been interested too. I would have appreciated you know, being told. My manager would say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you. I'll tell you next time. Or in a job interview. I said, you don't need an interpreter. You know, we don't, it's going to take more time. You can lip read. You can lip read, can't you? Right, we can have 
send each other, we can get by, we don't need an interpreter. Do you have people face this type of response often? Or, you know, they, they're not encouraged to stay in low paying menial jobs, or they get in through the front door, but they're not promoted. Or they just don't find that they're being given equal opportunities to be able to progress and develop like their, their colleagues, people who are hired up after them. Uh, progressing and they're not. Remember, employers and service rights have an obligation to ensure that they respect everyone's human rights. And thinking about the cost of interpreters as well and how people might use that as a reason to not make an adjustment. Unfortunately, what we see with the Equal Opportunity Act is Discrimination can unfortunately happen, and I don't have the time to go into greater detail about that, but it would be important to talk to the Commission if you would like more information. But one more slide to go, and then we're actually going to be pausing for a break. I know I've shared a lot of information with you. Hopefully it's all been making sense so far. Um, but I wanted to talk now about what, when is an adjustment not reasonable? Often the law will be referred to when a complaint being made. Questions will be asked such as, what is your disability? Is it deafness? Uh, what, what job is it that you've had an issue with? What was the adjustment that you require? If the adjustment is expensive or will take a long time to put into place, or this adjustment means there'll be further impact on other people um, by this adjustment being made um, to other individuals or the organisation, that adjustment can be deemed not reasonable. If it's a small adjustment that needs to be made, or say um, if it's to do with a deaf person being able to drive, say for example, deaf people being able to be employed as truck drivers, um, the ability to make an adjustment in those situations is more straightforward or fairly easy, but the responsibility of who has to prove whether or not an adjustment is reasonable is on the organisation. If a it is the organisation's responsibility to justify why uh, something may not be reasonable and why they would be denying a person with a disability certain uh, access. So we are going to break now and we'll be back shortly. Hopefully you can get a cup of tea, a coffee, a drink, um, mull over the information that's shared with you. Please ask questions. I love questions. Um, like to engage with you all so please uh, give the information some thought and uh, ask some questions and we'll see you shortly. Hi everybody, uh, thank you Philip for the content you've shared today. We've had some questions that have come through. Hopefully you can all see me okay. We are going to have a break as Philip just mentioned for 10 minutes. Go to the toilet, um, make yourselves comfortable drink a refreshment and then we'll reconnect or rejoin uh, in 10 minutes. So please uh, continue to send through your questions through SMS, through the Q&A function on Zoom or adding a comment to the Facebook live stream. See you all soon in 10 minutes. Thank you.
for the uh, first Q&A session. So it look like it's you there. Ready and ready to go. Yeah, I'm going to ask you the tough questions. Or should I call a friend, actually? You know, like, who wants to win a millionaire? I might need some help. Or the 50-50 split. What if I have to call? What if I have to pay the million dollars? I'm, I'm, I'm skint. No, I'm not giving you a million dollars. I'm not calling a friend of this woman. All right, the first question is, um, you from very often just number of complaints and that disability was the predominant area. What are the, the, the regular or recurring themes? All the inquiries we receive, 43% are disability related. Mostly, I believe, 80% are about employment issues, so difficulties gaining employment or facing discrimination at work, lack of opportunities, uh, whether they're promotional opportunities, training opportunities, or general access in the workplace, which might be at a tutorial base as well. Interesting. So there's a diversity within the disability category. Mm. Okay. Now, you made reference to the third piece of legislation, and you were not going to go into any detail regarding the Racial and Tolerance Act. Um, does that relate to deaf people and deaf culture? Like, is there not a connection there? So the racial, the definition uh, in terms of skin colour, those from migrant backgrounds or multicultural backgrounds, it's not really uh, deafness related. Religion, of course, deafness isn't a religion. Well, maybe uh, Auslan is to some people. Well, what, what if Auslan is my religion? Um, so that act may not be relevant, but if you are a deaf person that's a Muslim or a deaf person um, from a migrant background, you can um, uh, apply under those laws, both the Equal Opportunity Act and the RTA, as it's called, or the RRTA, but it's quite difficult um, to have any success in, in the legal sense of that one. It's going through a current update. But deaf people, um, we know that isn't only one attribute, that they have other attributes, whether it's age, uh, migrant, background, uh, gender, uh, unemployed or employed. Uh, so there are different ways you can apply the law based on your own personal circumstance. Okay, so we have to separate deaf culture and race and racial problems. Okay, so how about uh, when we talk about these attributes, okay, and you went through a few of them, it's that deaf, I'm a woman, and so on. Um, do I need help and support just for one area? If I need like multiple supports because I'm being discriminated against on like, these different you know, attributes, how can I try to get equal access based upon all those particular attributes? So I just hold on for we need to spotlight you. People can't see you. Over to you. Okay, I hope everybody can see me. Spotlight's just on me. I feel like I've got lots of space now. Um, so when you make contact with the Commission or if you make contact with Deaf Victoria, either way, um, we have uh, a database. So when people make um, contact, we take your details and the people who um, respond to your initial inquiry will, will ask you some questions about uh, you as a person, um, which, uh, what type of discrimination are you facing, and at that time, uh, is when they might identify you're receiving multiple levels of different discrimination, whether it's your skin colour, uh, you're pregnant, you're a breastfeeding mother, you might be a lesbian. The different aspects of who you are um, might determine then the various levels of discrimination you're facing. So often it isn't just one area of your life, but there are other attributes or barriers that you're facing um, from a particular organisation or individual. Um, that relate to multiple areas of your life. So often at the Commission we know, as an example, we're thinking about gender. Women are often more discriminated against than males and um, people with a disability face more discrimination than those without a disability. So there are some areas um, or some attributes where we see people facing discrimination more regularly and the legal system and court system are very familiar with the responses that are required in those situations. Okay, thank you for those responses, Rob. That's really interesting food to have thought. We've got so many rights, and we know that there's a lot of 
um, support for us out there advocacy. Because like you said, if I'm a woman, deaf, these other things are happening under discrimination, coming in my different ways, coming at me in different ways, like, where do I go to, like Deaf Victoria, the Commission, traditionally the men working in factories, um, how, where can they go, where can an individual go to, how do they know who they should call or contact, um, is it like a referral service, uh, how does it work, and how do people get support, just hold on, I need to spot on you again. Yes, and that's why it's important um, for organisations to work closely um, with each other. Deaf Victoria stands for spotlights. Not for me at the moment. I think we might be having some technical problems. I might just wait. I'm told otherwise. Captain, should I respond now? I believe the spotlight is on me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it's important organisations have good relationships. So Deaf Victoria and Victorian Equal Opportunity Human Rights Commission, we also have um, relationships with a variety of different law firms uh, and law representatives and other commissioners like the Gender Commissioner, Small Business Commissioner or Commission, uh, various legal fraternities, uh, the, the police force, uh, the Victorian Ombudsman, as well and they look after all complaints when we receive a complaint we will uh, have we will make the connection with the victorian ombudsman who has more uh, regulatory power than us um, and can enforce the law in a variety of different circumstances but the commission also provides support and advice and education and also referral onto the most appropriate government or private organization Thanks for that comprehensive response. Okay, so Deaf Victoria here, I just want to interrupt this point in time. So Deaf Victoria can provide individual advocacy. Okay? So we're, we're funded to provide individual advocacy to you. Uh, regardless of where you live in Victoria, you can't contact us, regardless of the attribute. So we can talk about advocacy strategies and different approaches. There's so many different ways you can approach them. We won't tell you how provide the information support to you so you can make a decision. Um, we'll talk a little bit more, more about advocacy and support later. Um, but there's one more question for you, Philip. Okay, so when we talk about indirect discrimination, can you just please expand upon this? Because there's, let's say, a deaf migrant that wants to move to Australia, or someone else here wants to apply for a visa, um, and English is their second language. Can they argue indirect, indirect discrimination based upon that English language requirement? So the difference uh, in terms of direct or indirect discrimination. So direct is uh, something where uh, discrimination that directly occurs on an individual, whereas indirect discrimination might be a, a new rule that's put in place and there's impact systemically across the board. So an example of that might be the Victorian government. Um, and if you want to work for the Victorian government, you must have a current driver's license, which then means there's indirect discrimination as a result of this broad rule. Does that mean that people with low vision or that are blind um, can't get a job with the Victorian government or those that don't drive and catch public transport? So often, um, we see examples of that, but I can't provide legal advice about the particular situation um, you've shared, Catherine. My, uh, my advice would be to make contact with um, a lawyer or a legal organisation, but from my perspective, it does look like it would be indirect discrimination, so it would be worth that person um, contacting Deaf Victoria or the Commission to follow up further and provide more detailed advice and facts based on that individual uh, circumstance. But if say an employer says to their staff member or is, doesn't want to um, employ someone, prefers somebody over that person, that's direct discrimination. But if there's a rule that all people must pass an English literacy test and if you fail that, you will be deported or not be 
provide a bit visa, then that's indirect discrimination. But if it's that, well, I um, communicate in Auslan, and the employer might respond by adjusting the test, making a reasonable adjustment to make it accessible to the person who uses Auslan. So if they can, they should, and if they can't make any changes, if it's too expensive or it would take too long for them to do that, or would have impact, adverse impact on other people, then it might not be deemed as unreasonable. Um, and a, and a, that can be unfortunate, but that is the fact of what happens at times. Thank you for clarifying that indirect discrimination. Um, sometimes it's hard to work out really if you are being discriminated against directly, indirectly. Um, we know that employers do receive some funding to provide reasonable justice for people with disabilities in the workplace. Now, one other thing, let's say a deaf person moved to Australia and are facing these barriers. Um, this deaf person may have a different sign language, a national sign language, but then they arrive in Australia. Compared to a deaf person in Australia, okay, and they're using Auslan, okay, um, they may not face that indirect discrimination like a deaf migrant, but there's so many different types of, as we discussed, direct and indirect discrimination. So as Philip said, um, we really need to, to be seeking legal advice. This is an information session and community workshop, okay? This is not an opportunity to, to take on individual questions and provide legal advice. We're not providing that. But we do encourage you to contact the Commission of Law Deaf Victoria to understand your rights, um, information, options and the next steps that you can take okay, when we do not provide legal advice. Now, with those questions and uh, answers, we'll hand back to Philip to continue on the presentation. Please continue asking questions uh, via uh, Q&A button and Philip will continue on his presentation. Philip. Okay. Thanks for those questions watching. I just want to make sure, uh, is the PowerPoint coming back up? It's coming now, Philip. It should be there. There you are. Just go back. One more slide. And another slide. Forward. Uh, the case study of a mother. First, I just wanted to say thank you for those questions. It's nice having uh, engagement and contact with you all, so thanks for sending those through. One thing I do want to clarify, the difference between the Equal Opportunity Act and the Charter, um, there are big differences between those two. The Equal Opportunity Act is for everybody in Victoria, individuals or organisations, if it's an individual case of discrimination or an organisation or a government, whereas the Charter of Human rights is for government. So therefore, if it's the Department of Health and Human Services or the Department of Transport or the Victoria Police or the Department of Education or universities as well, really any organisation who receives funding from the Victorian government is obliged to adhere to the Charter, so they cannot therefore discriminate. The Charter is a significantly powerful law and a very clear law. If an organisation tries to discriminate, it's easy to um, act and um, make people more accountable, whereas the, Equal Op the, the Opportunity Act is not as um, clear-cut. So the Charter is applicable for government departments or those that are funded by government. So say it's a sporting club, for example, they discriminate against a person. Um, so the funding from that cricket club is from the Victorian government. So there's no uh, ability for them to discriminate. There would be a good case for someone to um, apply through the discrimination uh, legalities to get that situation changed. So I just wanted to make that clear too. So it's an important point. And another thing as well before I forget too, in terms of the NDIS, the National Disability Insurance Scheme, interestingly, the NDIS is national, it's funded by the federal government, but all states um, have contributed funding for the National Disability Insurance Scheme. 
as well, the Commonwealth Government have contributed funds to that scheme as well. But the Victorian money that's put forward for those funds therefore means each Victorian citizen uh, that accesses the NDIS has rights under the Charter of Human Rights. So if an LAC or a planner or an NDIS service provider discriminates, you can actually use the Charter as well as the Equal Opportunity Act um, to support you in um, making a case to receive adjustments or whatever it may be. So that's an important point as well, even though it's a federal system or federal scheme, you still have rights under the Victorian Charter. So, okay, I, I want to get through the slide deck so we can have more chance for question and answers. So I wanted to provide some real life examples now of um, some people that our call centre um, has dealt with some inquiries specifically about deaf people. So we're going to go through those now. It's a point of discussion, but obviously these photos uh, don't represent those people and the names have been changed as well to protect their identities. So we, rather than the community knowing who these people might be, um, we've respected that confidentiality and uh, changed some of the details there. But this example here is a mother of a deaf child. The child is in primary school. And because of uh, COVID and the restrictions with all children learning from home, at that time, um, there was uh, supports provided to the child to make sure she could access her education, being a deaf student, learning from home, the, and the online uh, teaching through Zoom or whatever platform was being used by the school being predominantly audio-based. The deaf child couldn't access their learning. There was no access to captioning or other adjustments being made. And the mother had contacted the school uh, presenting the issue and the school said, it's, it's not my problem. The home is the responsibility of you as the mother, so you need to provide those supports. The mother then contacted the commission because the school falls under the Victorian government, charter is applied, and we were um, able to let the mother know about her rights under the charter. And the school and the mother were brought together at the commission in a mediation where we were able to explain to the school um, the need for them to oblige to the charter and the rights of uh, the child in terms of having access to their schooling during this time and the adjustments that need to be made. So that's a good example of a successful case um, where the Commission was able to support this family to make sure this child was able to access their homeschooling. And another example I wanted to share in terms of an NDIS plan, I was planning on actually talking about the point that I just made before here, so there you go. So a deaf person who lives here in Victoria, the NDIS plan they received was one they weren't happy with. It didn't um, resolve any of the barriers that they were facing. Their local area coordinator really didn't meet the needs or, or identify the needs clearly of this deaf person. So this deaf person uh, made contact with the commission. And we again uh, made them aware of the charter their rights under the Charter as a Victorian citizen. And the conversation then was had with the LAC about the Charter and their responsibilities under the Charter. The issue was uh, escalated to a senior LAC and a better plan. As a result, um, a better plan was then created for uh, this Victorian person. So an example of you, if you feel as though your needs aren't being met, uh, you can use the Charter as an advocacy tool make sure your needs are met. Here we have um, an example of an elderly uh, couple who are in a nursing home. And the nursing home won't provide interpreting supports uh, weekly or every fortnight. And at this nursing home, the daughter made contact with the commission and said, uh, my mother's uh, deaf in a nursing home and the nursing home are refusing to provide our supports which is having an impact on um, this person's mother's mental state and her inability to socialise with the other residents in the nursing home but the nursing home was saying that the financial costs were nothing were not what they, they weren't wanting to accept the financial costs but the case was made that um, this was discrimination by the child. 
Minister Home receives funding from the state government as well as the federal government. Because they receive funding from the state government here in Victoria, they have obligations under the Charter and it is important that they provide access, whether it's communication or reasonable adjustments to meet the needs of a person with a disability. So the nursing home, upon realising uh, their obligations under the Charter, um, were not able to just respond by saying they had no funds because it is a reasonable adjustment for them to spend those funds to provide access. So another example I wanted to share with you is this individual, Jamie who has a serious mental health condition, uh, suffers from depression, and when they're feeling stressed or agitated, uh, find themselves unable to communicate. This person was arrested by the police on the street. Uh, the police assessed them as being disorderly and intoxicated, so were put into uh, a jail cell and when wasn't provided access to interpreters. Jamie was saying, I want an interpreter they were determining that he was drunk and weren't going to provide support to him. Jamie was actually under 18 and the police not being able to communicate with him didn't realise this, so they had broken several laws. Um, firstly, him being underage and being um, held in a jail cell and secondly, not providing him communication assistance being a deaf person. So this was a significant case, actually. Um, I'm not exactly sure how it was resolved, but this was presented to the Commission um, and is an example um, of situations where not only one law is breached, but it could be multiple. So this other example here is uh, Peter, who is a, a gay deaf man. So he had um, supports through the NDIS, which um, was some daily supports to help him access the community. And Peter wanted to go to a gay bar with access to an interpreter, but the organisation was refusing him and saying, well, we can't find a support worker that's comfortable being at a gay bar and providing you the supports you need. So as a service provider, uh, they said, um, you know, one of our staff members attending at, at a gay bar, no, that wasn't appropriate. Whether or not they assessed it as being high risk, they refused him. And... Peter said, well, it's no different to any other person that you might provide support with in terms of access in the community. This is um, a part of my community that I want to um, access. And the organisation was refusing that and, and forcing Peter to socialise and be involved in programs with other people that the service was supporting. He made contact with the Commission and we brought them together for a mediation and um, really educated the organisation that he, as an individual, has the right to determine um, what, where he would like his support provided, and, and that is uh, protected under the Charter, again. So the service provider, uh, upon realising their obligations in the Charter, um, then provided him support services to access uh, the gay bar that he wanted to attend. So the, the Charter... I'm going to go into more detail now about all Victorian uh, government departments, including the court system, the parliament, all public authorities. An example of that might be universities, water boards, water organisations, school providers, hospitals, healthcare providers. So they all have responsibilities under the Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities Act 2006. There have been amendments and updates made over the years since its implementation in 2006. I'll move into the next slide, thank you. So there are different rights that are protect, protected in the Charter. In um, the Equal Opportunity Act, there are certain attributes, whether it's an individual who's um, gay, or deaf, or a migrant. The Charter talks about protect rights that are protected in the Charter. So the rights um, to equality before the law. That all people have the right to equality before the law. The right to life, if someone's sick and in hospital and the hospital refusing to provide support to a deaf person, everyone has rights to life under the Charter. 
as well the protection from torture, uh, degrading treatment, forced work, freedom of movement. Um, Peter the Gay Man, as an example, wanting to attend the gay uh, bar with supports. Him having the right to freedom of movement is protected under the Charter. The rights to privacy and reputation, so um, no um, bad um, comments being made about someone that might um, tarnish their reputation. There are privacy laws here in uh, Victoria as well as nationally that are related to the Charter here. If you feel as though somebody, say an example might be an interpreter um, sharing confidential information that has damage, uh, has potential to cause damage or is sharing information um, about you, the um, service provider, say it's at a hospital and the interpreter is interpreting for you in a hospital and learns something about you and shares that to other people because it's a hospital service that that interpreter is providing their services at, uh, you have uh, rights protected under the Charter to do with your confidentiality to protect your information. As well, um, as a person, your right to um, religion, thought, conscious and belief that you can't be discriminated against on that or if you're wanting to um, provide thought or opinion, whatever it may be, you have a right to express that, whether it's through art or it's through particular devices to enable you to communicate. If you need, say as an example, at school, uh, you have a right to access that device to allow you free thought. The right to freedom of, um, or number 16 rather, peaceful assembly and freedom of association. When it comes to um, service providers or people saying deaf people can't gather together as a community, you should um, socialise with the mainstream. Really, it's, it's not, um, you have rights protected to enable you peaceful assembly and freedom of association with of your choosing. So some more rights continued in, in, in the Charter, um, rights to protection of families and children, an example of that might be in hospital, uh, the refusal of interpreting services and my child being sick, for example, uh, at risk of my child's health, um, the declining of interpreting services and the impact it might have, rights to take part in public life, cultural rights, property rights, security of the person, um, and the rights to children in the criminal process, a variety of different um, rights that are protected in the Charter. And I want to share an example with you, uh, most recently with the, the lockdowns, if you remember, in the Housing Commission, Housing Commission Towers. There were eight towers, if you remember at the time, that were placed into lockdown um, because there was concern about uh, COVID being spread within um, those Housing Commission towers. And upon announcing the lockdown, uh, there was police um, there not allowing people to leave. And you can see the breaches. If it's their right to assembly, their right to religion, their right to um, take part in public life. The Commission uh, was involved with a variety of different organisations um, working with government to make sure these people were um, appropriately respected and their rights realised. So their right to fresh air, as an example, because many of these um, spaces that these people uh, lived, there was no fresh air, there was no balconies, no ability. So anyway, I, I digress ever so slightly, but just an example, a recent example to share. Okay, so any person that works in the Victorian Government Public Service or from a service that is funded by the Victorian Government, if a decision is made, yes, no, you can, you can't, a policy or system, if you think to yourself, what rights uh, do I have here? So that's the first step, what rights do I have when you see something? something is said to you. Okay, number one, will it breach one of those you know, different 20 attributes? If it does, then it's, it's not on. It's clear discrimination. But let's say you then go
go through the, the process of the second step, which is limiting. It may not be a, a full breach, but you may be limited in some way. That cannot happen when you apply the chart. Third step, if it's not limited, um, is it justified or justifiable? Okay, so we're talking about different rights here. What is what is right? So, for example, uh, the set of emergencies being called. We have you know eight pm to five am curfews. We have to wear masks. You have to stay within a five kilometre radius. That is justified because the Victorian Parliament and the Commission have had uh, many meetings. Um, the right to life and public safety will trump your individual freedom of movement. Okay. So when they talked about curfews, um, uh, they are also time limited for a period of time. It's not indefinite. Okay. Um, so you may want to see what happened here is the Victorian Parliament consulted with the Commission with many lawyers to come up with all of these different new justified uh, limitations. The Victorian Parliament, so this is not any Victorian service provider, it could be um, police, education providers, business, Parliament, community organisations. If the Parliament wants to come together to repeal a law or enact a new law, they have to have this framework in place existing legislation and the proposed amendments in some way infringe or have some type of negative impact. Um, they have to be able to justify that they do not. The Commission uh, has a legal team in place, so all new proposed pieces of legislation are basically reviewed to ensure that there's no breaches of our human rights. And if there is a potential breach, this will be raised with the Parliament and the Parliament will be informed as to why. So this is a very powerful piece of legislation. So there's a hierarchy of legislation. over have different types of legislation. All legislation is not equal. The Charter of Human Rights is one of the most preeminent pieces of legislation in our state. So we're very fortunate living here in Victoria for many reasons. Do you know that Victoria is the only state that has a charter? Queensland, I think, will have one in the, the near future. Western Australia is some way off. Other states have different pieces of legislation like we do, an Equal Opportunity Act or equal, uh, other type of similar legislation. But you know, I just started learning more about the law. Victoria is the only state in Australia that has an Equal Opportunity Act, as other jurisdictions do. But no one else has a charter like Victoria does. No other state or territory. Yes, we have the Australian Human Rights Commission, the AHRC. And... The Australian Human Rights Commission has done a lot of work with the Australian federal government, as you know, we do on the state level here, but they haven't been successful in getting that charter. We're very fortunate that we have a parliament that has endorsed this charter. We now have these rights. Okay, the last slide, I think, in this PowerPoint presentation, but so how to complain, as I said earlier on. If you feel comfortable putting your complaint in Auslan, then please contact the Victoria, have that consultation with them, or you can contact the Commission. There are different people, different organisations you can contact after tonight. Uh, contact details, what we're talking about, our websites, not email addresses. But our website I will be shared. And this how to complain slide was taken from the Commission's website. Call us via the Vita Relay service. You can send an email, you have a conversation, you can contact us via uh, online or a chat function um, regarding you know, sexual harassment in the workplace. I haven't got into that this evening, but we also talk about sexual harassment in the workplace. We receive many uh, inquiries, complaints about different types of harassment um, that do take all different forms racial, religious discrimination disability discrimination in the workplace. So there are resources in all these different um, areas, these different types of settings and attributes. Now, everyone's familiar with flexible work practices, whether it's working at home or some other type of way, maybe uh, changed hours rather than when I say you know, 9 to 5. Let's say uh, you wanted something from 5 a.m. Um, you know, 
other agencies, organisations like us have a chatbot, um, which will be able to assist you if you go online. Okay, you talk about flexible work uh, arrangements. You talk to our website via the chatbot, and they'll direct you to the relevant area on the website, make it easier for you to navigate to find information. It may be something to do with like, parental responsibilities or carer responsibilities, or working from home. Uh, due to coronavirus, most people who are working in offices uh, have flexible work arrangements and are working at home. But prior to COVID, most employers' the initial response was no. Do you know what? Coronavirus has changed that mindset, that paradigm. It's much easier now to have flexible work arrangements because that's become the norm for a lot of people. Now, in terms of formal complaints, there are different forms that you need to complete and they're available on our website. Uh, there's also the community story tool. So if you see something, you see some type of discrimination taking place, racism, put down, vilification, and you feel as though that it could be a, a breach of human rights, we are encouraging people to report that to us on our website. Okay, guess what? I'm sorry, I thought that was the last, but it was the second last. This is my last one. Okay, we are not all the same. And I'll be sharing our website details with you. Thank you for your interest, your engagement. Um, it's not a true Q&A session face-to-face, -face, but this has been good. Virtual. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. And look forward to our Q&A session now. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Philip, for a great presentation. Pleasure. Good drink. Yes. Well deserved. Uh, there are a few questions still coming through, uh, so we will shoot those through now. To give you some time just to relax the hand. So the first question being asked is, if as a deaf person uh, needing some legal advice, who should I contact if I have faced discrimination? Is it Deaf Victoria or the Commission? Where do I get legal advice from? Well, you're welcome to contact Deaf Victoria or the Commission. Uh, another place you could contact, uh, they have access to more access to legal advice, is the Victorian Ombudsman. So really, it's whatever you think is most comfortable for you, or if you have a preference, uh, you can contact either one of these three, depending on the matter if it's a workplace matter with a may require employment related advocacy. If it's an education matter, it may require education type advocacy. So look around, explore your options. So also from the perspective of Deaf Victoria, if you um, don't necessarily um, want to speak with an individual at Deaf Victoria, we have multiple staff members here as well, then you can feel comfortable um, requesting or of course um, making contact with Specifically, Deaf Victoria um, is able to provide you guidance through the process and provide you that support, whether it's attending um, a local legal service or attending uh, different appointments with you um, to support you throughout your case. So Deaf Victoria is, is here to help you navigate and uh, support you throughout your journey. Now for the next question uh, coming through, which I know you'll be able to answer. Uh, if I was in hospital as a patient, as a deaf person, and feel as though, one, I'm, I'm a patient and being unwell um, as a result, of course, of going to hospital, but at the same time, feeling like I need to be an advocate and explain to the health staff that I need access to an interpreter, whether it's face-to-face -face or VRI or captioning, it's difficult having to manage that during a time like that. I can respond to that question from Deaf Victoria. That's a perfect example of where you can make contact with Deaf Victoria. And we can provide you support during this time where you can focus on your health and we can be that advocate for you. We know many deaf people feel over their lives and have to constantly advocate every day, uh, whether it's reminding people of your needs, their rights. Deaf Victoria is here to support you in those times. So please do remember you can make contact with us and we will be there to support you. Recently, um, open captions 
were have become available um, in cinemas due to it being deemed a reasonable adjustment. And the reasonable adjustment was seen to be captive view, which we know many people call crapped view. <laughs> because yes, it not meeting their their needs. So the government made a determination that captive view was a reasonable adjustment. But the people that use that service, the deaf community, don't determine it as being reasonable and doesn't actually meet their needs. Can you then make another case against something that has been deemed as resolved? That's a good question, Kate. Never asked that. Uh, who's responsible for administering this piece of law in Victorian cinemas? Is it the Victorian Parliament or is it the Australian Parliament? Is it a federal piece of legislation too? I think that's the first question. And I actually I forgot to mention that earlier on. So if there's some discrimination taking place, the first um, question is who's responsible to administer uh, legislation, which legislation it comes under. So a Victorian hospital, the Victorian government, uh, the NDS, the Australian government, um, uh, the Victorian police, the Victorian government, but if it's the Australian federal police, the AFP, that's obviously the Commonwealth government. So that's the first question. I'm not sure, Kate, in terms of cinema uh, captioning, and if there is a particular a distinct piece of legislation in force uh, in federal legislation regarding uh, cinemas, but I think. If I were you, I'd contact the Commission or the Ombudsman, uh, put forward the scenario and ask what options do I have available to me? Because as a Victorian, with you're facing a particular type of uh, barrier. But remember, cinemas, okay, are not bound by the Charter because they're private enterprises. So if there's some discrimination, uh, taking place there, then you need to refer to the Equal Opportunity Act, not the Charter. But if the Victorian government funded the cinema for some particular reason, then they're bound by the Charter and it's game over. Great, thank you for that. Another question that's come through, if there are some legal proceedings taking place and an agreement can't be made, or if you're going through mediation and you still can't come to an agreement, if you have to pursue a legal case, who pays for the cost of lawyers? Who covers that cost? I'm not a lawyer. I um, can't really definitely answer that question, but the commissioner, sorry, the commission and the ombudsman, I know do provide some free information, but it's not legal advice. Okay. Uh, I think it would be prudent if you went to the Commission or the Ombudsman to get that information as to where you could go to to receive that legal support. If you made a complaint to the Commission about some alleged discrimination, we would then say, okay, we've tested that out. It looks like discrimination at first blush on its face. We then would bring you and the other party in. Um, we'd have a case conference and work out the issues and then play and then what was required and it could be providing what was denied or it could be you know, some type of compensation agreement but if we did not move past there then we have to go to Victorian Ombudsman uh, and that's when lawyers can be involved from that point on but yeah, in terms of lawyers uh, Kate you may have more knowledge than I do in terms of who pays the legal that's right. As um, Philip mentioned, um, that the Commission really, the Commission in Deaf Victoria can provide advice or information rather about um, your rights. We can provide resources, but individual cases uh, are often unique. So if you want specific advice, uh, we would encourage you to uh, make contact with legal services. But Deaf Victoria, as I said before, can provide you support to access those services and while you're accessing those services, provide you support. If you uh, need the services of a lawyer, there are um, free uh, 
services available through the Victorian Legal Aid. Uh, there are offices dotted around Victoria. So if you're wanting specific legal advice, you can access that for free. And if you make contact with Deaf Victoria, we can support you uh, in accessing that service. So the next question that I have for you, Philip, that's come through, asks about the NDIS. If you feel as though the plan you've received uh, doesn't meet your needs, you're not happy uh, with the plan, who should you make contact with? Is it the Quality and Safeguards Commission? Or is it Disability Discrimination Commissioner? Or the Victorian Equality and Human Rights Commission? So the NDIS is national, but your rights are protected by Veriog here in Victoria. So could you clarify who you should contact in that situation? Okay, to be honest with you, Kate, okay. I'm not fully across the process because I haven't needed to uh, go down that path. I've had good experiences today with the local area coordinator. But there, I think, you know, don't just put all your eggs in one basket and say, you know, pursue different options. So for people who are deaf or hard of hearing that work with the NAS, I know that there's a Facebook page that's been set up for a deaf and hard of hearing people this world, you can put questions there, um, or look for you know, past conversations and threads about situations and issues that have been raised. Take some um, information or guidance from that. Maybe, like the example I um, shared earlier on, that a um, particular person in that scenario wasn't happy, and then they escalated that to a senior local area coordinator, and then after that they raised it and escalated to the National Disability Insurance Agency. So I'm not sure in terms of who, what, the where, the phone numbers. But what I do want to say is in terms of disability, you said that you're talking about the Disability Discrimination Commission, or should you go there? Okay. Well, remember, that's the, the Commonwealth uh, level. It's not the Victorian State level if you want to go there. Okay, you may want to add something on that. Yes, also with the NDIA, we know plans are very unique and individual and I think we need to meet uh, to get your plan with your local area coordinator. And you can also um, access support services during uh, your planning meeting. Often there's a lot of information that you need to provide at your planning meeting which can be quite difficult. So again, Deaf Victoria can provide you support during your planning meeting. Um, so please feel free to make contact with us um, and we are able to provide you support during your planning meeting, whether it's before you receive your plan or it's during a plan review meeting. Deaf Victoria has provided support to Deaf community members um, with particular reports, whether it's accessing um, an audiogram or an OT. You can also um, have a support letter from Deaf Victoria to help you access the NDIS. So, conscious of time, last few questions before we wrap up for this evening. Again, with the NDIS, um, thinking about another Commonwealth service, Centrelink, Centrelink services, whether it's support pensions or other um, supports you're receiving through them. If you're having um, difficulty accessing services, can Deaf Victoria or Berioc help? Philip, do you know the answer to that? Well, I can um, say Deaf Victoria can help uh, for those who live in Victoria. Phil, I believe you might want to wait. We'll spotlight you now. In terms of Centrelink, remember, Centrelink is administered by the Australian government. So what I would recommend is, in the first instance, you talk to Deaf Victoria or the Commission or Centrelink directly. So look, I'm unhappy with this decision or this arrangement or seek a review on a decision by a senior person. If yeah, you don't have a lot of information about Centrelink and Deaf related specific matters, I would encourage you to go to Deaf Victoria individual advocacy. Wow, there are a lot of different uh, topics and scenarios um, 
being talked about here. And we know um, people don't only face discrimination during business hours, between nine and five, often things might happen at night. And questions come through whether or not Deaf Victoria can provide support uh, during those times. Unfortunately, our office does close at five. Um, so if you do um, face uh, some difficulties after five, um, when it comes to accessing interpreting supports, you can make contact with uh, Auslan Connections. We have an after hours uh, contact number and they can um, organise interpreting services, whether it's face to face or VRI, but you aren't responsible for making that contact. It is the hospital service that has to take on that responsibility. But if you still face difficulties, you can make contact with us first thing in the morning and or ask Auslan Connections to make contact with us on your behalf as well. Unfortunately, we um, aren't able to provide advocacy services uh, around the clock 24-7, but if you make contact with us through our social media platforms, through SMS or email, um, we know during COVID times um, it, it does pose some difficulty not being able to meet people face-to-face, uh, -face, but we still do have the option of being able to support you uh, through technology and connecting in through video calls. And some people have asked about intake services and how Deaf Victoria um, provides support and what our intake process is like. If you think about a hospital as an example, when you present to the hospital, uh, often it, there is a triage process where uh, there'll be people uh, waiting for a service and dependent on the need and the severity of the need will determine who receives the support first. And similarly at Deaf Victoria, we triage uh, requests that come through and we're there to provide support to everybody but uh, the deaf community is our priority but we will uh, make decisions based on uh, the severity of the requests that come through but we're here to support the community. Phil over to you for final comments before we close up. Yes I just would like to say one last thing. Um, as a deaf person I face those barriers of discrimination every day of my life just like one of you do. Uh, it can be easy to lose faith, easy to think this is all too much and too hard to throw in the towel. Uh, for those that really want to do something, I would encourage you to reach out, okay? explain your situation, ask for some information and some options. Think about yourself, but also others around you and, and people who are coming in behind you, because you know all of us um, can make those small individual changes which lead to community changes which benefit everyone. So. As uh, someone asked earlier on about cinema caption, captioning, open captioning in cinemas by a captive view, people took that upon themselves, individuals did, to try and improve access. So the rising tide um, lifts all boats. So let's think about it from that point of view, not just as individuals, but as a part of a community, to try and make it better for not just ourselves, but for others. Human rights are everyone's business, and human rights are for all. They're here to make our lives better, easier. I look forward to Melissa Hale uh, to our line in her presentation. Uh, and I think Kate's got some exciting announcements, so I don't want to steal their thunder. I'll leave it at that. So thank you everyone for your interest and engagement tonight. Um, feel free to contact me at the Commission if you want to contact me rather than speak to an individual officer who's maybe not deaf or doesn't communicate more so. I'd be happy to talk to you and we'll take it from there. Thanks everyone and good night. It's, it's strange, isn't it, that uh, you can't see everybody uh, applauding you, so uh, I'll represent everybody watching in uh, passing on our thanks to you for such uh, an engaging presentation, and thank you for presenting into late into the night. We're almost at 8 o'clock. Uh, the questions that have come through have been really amazing, and it's, it's wonderful to see us engaging and discussing this particular topic. Um, we know we could talk for a long time about human rights, um, and how we can best advocate to uphold our rights. So thank you everyone for the comments and questions that have come through. Thank you, Philip, for all your wonderful presentation. And Philip mentioned just briefly about tomorrow night. So there were questions that came through about advocacy, whether or not something was indirect or direct discrimination. Who can I get uh, to, uh, who can I best contact to receive support? There were lots of questions asked. Um, and lots of scenarios posed and how best you can advocate and 
how best um, an advocacy uh, strategy might suit certain situations. But we will be having further information shared tomorrow night about that very topic by Melissa Hale. And we're very excited to have on board. Tuesday night uh, is a night, finally, that I'm excited to join. Uh, normally there isn't much on TV or anything happening on a Tuesday night, but that's something exciting I'll be definitely tuning into. I'm going to pass over to uh, Cherie, who will officially close tonight. So bear with me for one moment whilst I connect her in. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Kate. Uh, and I agree with those comments that it was fantastic seeing the questions uh, being sent through tonight on Facebook and on Zoom and links perfectly into our topic for our community workshop tomorrow night. And how, and that focus is on advocacy and how to express what you need and how someone can meet your needs and what supports you need. Obviously, people can't read your mind. so. The ability to express what your needs are, what you would like in terms of a reasonable adjustment, and how you might approach those situations. So we will be covering those topics tomorrow night with Melissa Hale from the Disability Advocacy Resource Unit, or DARU as it's commonly known. Melissa was a previous manager of Deaf Victoria, is extremely knowledgeable about this topic and is an amazing advocate and can go into great detail specifically from that deaf perspective. So if you're wanting advocacy support, again, please do make contact with uh, Deaf Victoria. Kate is our advocacy officer. Um, you can make contact in a variety of means, whether it's email, uh, SMS, video, whatever it may be. Those options are there and we're here to support you. A part of the project um, funding we've received from the NDIS and the ILC uh, program um, has enabled us to hold these workshops so we're thankful for the funding from the NDIS and also a big thank you to Philip and the Victorian Equal Opportunity Human Rights Commission for joining us tonight and presenting on your rights as a deaf person uh, which is extremely valuable information and we hope you feel more empowered and more knowledgeable about this topic um, that you can apply um, in the future. I'd also like to again thank Expression Australia for allowing us access to this space during this strange time. Uh, it's nice to be in a space other people, of course, adhering to those social distancing requirements. I'd like to say thank you to our interpreters this evening and our captioners for providing access support. And uh, that's an important part of Deaf Victoria's uh, approach to making sure all people are able to access this content and information. Uh, we know there are people joining us from other states around the country and as mentioned each state has their own unique set of rights and laws so I would encourage those joining us from interstate to look into uh, your own um, organisations that are state based and your own uh, commissions that can provide those specific details. Our funding has uh, a requirement for us to provide information that's specific to Victoria and our partnership of course with the Victorian Equal Opportunity Human Rights Commission means uh, our advice and expertise is uh, the state that we find ourselves in. So I encourage you to explore those uh, services in your own state. So we're fast approaching 8 o'clock, so thank you again everybody for joining us. Don't forget to register for the workshop, community workshop tomorrow night. We're really excited about it. Hopefully you're equally excited. If you've got any friends or family you know that would benefit um, from learning more about advocacy, please do share that information widely. Um, the Zoom link has been posted on our Facebook page. It's the same that you're connecting in tonight for tomorrow night. So thank you everybody. And uh, good night, and we'll see you tomorrow night. And do you want to meet the team so everyone can switch on their cameras and give you all the wave? Hopefully we can make that technology work. Does that include me? <laughs> oh, including the interpreters as well, we want to thank the interpreters for all the work they've done tonight. Great job, everybody. <laughs>